All right, we're going to start with blood. <clears throat> All right, the main functions of blood is to transport oxygen and, and nutrients from the digestive system to the body, the uh, cells of the body. And while it's taking the stuff that the cells need, it's also going to pick up the waste products um, that they produce. So it's transporting. Um, not only moving these things bad, but it's going to be moving some hormones around because uh, hormones are secreted in one location and function in another location. So the uh, main, main function of blood is to transport. It does a little bit of regulation. It uh, carries heat produced in our muscles to the rest of the body, keeping us warm. Uh, <coughs> um, our uh, blood contains carbon dioxide, which is what's going to uh, affect our pH and pH is very important. Uh, and then um, the organs of this, uh, the work of the circulatory system help maintain the volume. All right, they can, can squeeze down or expand so that we have the same approximate volume going on with it. They have some mechanisms to prevent blood loss and prevent uh, infections, and we'll get to those as we go. So what's blood made of? Mainly, it's a sticky fluid called plasma. Um, it, this has lots of things. It's got proteins in there. It's wa mainly water, but uh, we've got salts in there. Um, and it's about 55% of your blood is this. Then the part that we normally think of as blood is only is what we call the formed elements. The formed elements uh, make about 45% of it. This is called the hematocrit. So anytime you're in a medical setting and you talk about hematocrit, they're talking about the formed elements of the blood. Mainly the erythrocytes, but it's still the formed elements. And the erythrocytes are the red blood cells, the leukocytes are the white blood cells, and platelets, which are formed from thrombocytes. But those three things make up uh, the formed elements of blood. And here it is. So anybody can take blood, uh, put it into a tube, spin it down, and it'll separate out the plasma will be here on top, the straw colored stuff. And starting from this line right here, got this buffy coat down is the formed elements. <clears throat> now put it in a centrifuge and make it uh, separate out faster like this. But even if you didn't put it into a centrifuge and just let a, um, a, a test tube uh, sit there with blood, it will separate out like this eventually. All right, the bl blood production is called a hematopoiesis. Uh, you need to recognize this term. All right, hematopoiesis is talking about all the blood. Um, you get down to specific types like uh, erythropoiesis is red blood cells, leukopoiesis, white blood, so forth, thrombopoiesis is platelets. All of these start in the bones. Uh, hematopoiesis occurs in the bone marrow. Uh, I say start because with the white blood cells, depending upon what uh, type of blood cells are, they'll mature in different areas. All right, so let's start off with our red blood cells. Um, they'll last approximately 100, 120 days, which is, um, it takes about that long to regenerate them too, which is why you can only donate blood about every three months. Uh, there's no nucleus in the red blood cells. So that's what a nuclear. Anytime you have A in front of something, that means without. So A nuclear, it means there's no nucleus. Um, and these are great examples of structure and function. The biconcave shape of a disc of the uh, red blood cells. Um, it, well, yeah, it, it we'll explain that in the next picture. Uh, but uh, yes, we most studying we do with or various organisms we look at the structure of something and based on the structure we can determine the function or if we know what the function of something is we can it's easy to extract it back to what the structure would be uh, and that and we do a lot of comparative anatomy anybody who ever wants to go into uh, vet school they're going to do a lot of comparative anatomy because again structures structure determines function or they really it plays a big role in it uh, probably the main portion of them is hemoglobin, and uh, it takes up 97% of the non-water portion of it. 
there's four proteins, there's two alpha, two beta, and there's each one of the, each alpha and each beta has a heme group, which is where the iron is. And you have approximately 250 million of these per red blood cell. Let's look at that shape again. Um, in the, there's no nucleus in these cells, so remember that. Now, because of the shape, because they are pinched in the middle, right here, this biconcave where it curves in, that means no matter where you are on the inside of the cell, you're not very far from the edge. And that's important because red blood cells carry, we primarily we talk about them carrying oxygen, they also carry carbon dioxide, but because they're carrying um, oxygen. And the oxygen gets in by diffusion, which means there's no energy being used. And you don't want to have to travel a long way to either get into the red blood cell so it can be carried to another cell. But at that point, then it's got to leave the red blood cell to go to the, to the uh, your body cells. So you want that narrow structure in there. So that's the structure of it. And that goes right along with the function of what it does. Right, now these are your, this is the hemoglobin. You see two, there's a beta chain here and a beta chain here, alpha and alpha. And inside, the, in the middle of these is the heme group. That's where your iron is. This is what's going to hold an oxygen. So one hemoglobin molecule can hold four oxygen molecules. Okay. Um, carbon dioxide does stick to hemoglobin, but not at the iron, not at the heme group. It'll attach to the sides of the proteins. We're not worried about where it uh, does attach. It's just that it does attach them. So the hemoglobin can carry oxygen or carbon dioxide. So it's either going to be carrying one or the other. Keep that in mind always. <clears throat> Again, what's it do? It's carrying oxygen. And if it is bright red, it's got lots of oxygen in it. All right, red, uh, iron and oxygen make rust, gives you the red, red color. Now, if it's a darker red, it's not real bright, then that means it's carrying carbon dioxide. And see, again, not attached to the heme. But if it's, again, if it's dark red, it is carrying carbon dioxide, not oxygen. But it will be carrying one or the other. White blood cells, right? These vary. Um, some of them have a very short lifetime, again, from hours to some of them can be lifelong. Uh, protection uh, like when we get vaccines most of our objections yeah most of our vaccines will give us a lifelong uh, protection right uh, and that's from the white blood cells but not always right? now these are nucleated these have DNA in them so when they talk about getting DNA from blood they're actually getting it from the white blood cells not the red blood cells uh, red blood cells always oh, back up in uh, if I, red blood cells always stay inside of the blood vessel. They don't leave the blood vessel unless there's a break. White blood cells leave the blood uh, the blood vessels through a process called diapedesis. And if you've ever seen an amoeba move uh, under a microscope, that's kind of what they do. They just kind of stretch out and pull themselves along. And then they go through a process called chemotaxis. And that means they're moving based on, excuse me, based on chemicals in the environment. And what it is, um, they usually go towards these chemicals, so it's a positive chemotaxis, uh, that are released from cells that have been damaged or other white blood cells release this chemical to attract more to them. Your normal count for these is roughly 5,000 to 11,000 white blood cells per microliter, don't worry about the units, just know the numbers kind of. And so if you have more than 11,000, uh, higher than 11,000 count, that means you've probably got some kind of an infection. If you've got less than 5,000, you've probably got some kind of problem where you're not producing enough, right? So that's uh, just that's a reference range, and that's kind of a little bit, a large range, uh, but that's what a, the average is for everybody. Now, white blood cells would break these down to two main types, um, the granulocytes and the A granulocytes. Remember, the A means without. So, uh, and what all it is, it's so not that they don't actually have granules, but there's a, a stain they use called right stain, W-R-I-G-H-T. And when uh, you use right stain on these, 
uh, the granulocytes appear like little grain. You can see little grains inside of them, and the agranulocytes you just can't. So that's the difference between the two of them. Uh, just looking at them. So our granulocytes, the most common is called a neutrophil. All right, these are more common than any other white blood cell. Uh, they have they're lobed. So they call that a poly. Poly means more so polymorphonucleus and many shaped nucleus. And these are really big for bacteria. If you have a bacterial infection, you're going to have a lot of these, a lot of neutrophils. Eosinophils are a little bit different. You don't have a lot of these. Uh, if you're looking at them, you don't really have to understand, know these, don't uh, know that they do this, but they have two lobes and look like earmuffs. Uh, but if these are the kind that attack parasites, so if you get some kind of um, some kind of an infection from it, not from a bacteria, but from like a, say a hookworm, pinworm, something like that, tapeworm, you'll have more of these. Basophils are a little bit different, also. Um, few more, very few of these. These produce histamine, and these help attract white blood cells. Um, we'll come back here for this eosinophils. These are also a little bit into allergic reactions and asthma. Uh, so if you watch a commercial on TV that's advertising uh, asthma medicine, they're going to talk about how they kind of block eosinophils because they play a role in it. <clears throat> now your granule, I mean your A granulocytes, there's two main types, the lymphocytes and the monocytes. The lymphocytes are the second most common of all uh, white blood cells. These hang out in your lymph tissue, which means that they're not in your bloodstream. These would be like in your tonsils, in your spleen, in your lymph nodes, in your, you know, uh, uh, your throat and your uh, armpit. Two main type of them. T lymphocytes, uh, we produce a bunch of these to attack uh, um, virus infected cells to uh, take out the viruses and tumor cells. And then we have what we have called B lymphocytes. And these are what we call plasma cells. And plasma cells produce the antibodies that mark the viruses or any kind of a foreign antigen so that the T lymphocytes will go and attack them. The plasma cells are the ones that we really focus on for vaccines because uh, these are the ones that have that lifelong memory. Um, if you get this in there, if you get, if you have plasma cells for a certain infection, if that, that virus could, tries to get back into you again, or, or it could be a bacteria, because we have uh, vaccines for bacteria too, then these recognize it right away and produce a bunch of antibodies and they coat it and cover it. And they just, it's like setting up an alarm system and, and lights and sirens and everything that attracts all of the other, um, the T lymphocytes and all the other um, white blood cells to it to destroy it so you don't get an infection, so you don't get sick from it. And then we have monocytes. We don't have a lot of these. Um, when they're in the bloodstream, they're called monocytes. When they leave the uh, uh, bloodstream, we call them macrophages. And these are very phagocytic. And phagocytic means that they like to they eat other cells. And so these things will be they're roaming all through your body, and they have a voracious appetite. They will eat lots and lots of viral uh, things. They're really big on parasites. Any kind of a chronic infection that you have that keeps reoccurring, you're going to have a lot of these in the areas where those are occurring at. Um, so, yeah, these are just very phagocytic. They're big, too. That's why I call them macro because they're large. Here's pictures of them. So there's your neutrophil, your uh, eosinophil, your basophil. So you can kind of see the granules in them a little bit. Then over here, your lymphocytes and monocytes. All right, so that's it for the white blood cells. Now let's go to the platelets. Platelets are actually fragments of a cell. The uh, starting cell is called a megakaryocyte. And as it matures, then it, it breaks apart into little pieces. And those are called platelets. These don't last very long, five to 10 days. And these are very important for the clotting process, which is called 
hemostasis, hemo for blood, and stasis for maintaining it. It's a three-step process. Uh, and as a simplified, we're going to go already. Right, it's really a, a, quite a complicated um, system. There's lots of steps in it, but it's a, a vascular spasm, platelet plug, and coagulation. And we're going to go over each one of these a little bit. All right, so your vascular spasm. This is where you have damage to a blood cell or blood vessel, excuse me, where it's broken so the blood can leak out of it. Um, and the spasm is the muscles in the blood vessel itself will uh, close off to prevent any leaking. All right, so it's great in small vessels, and it'll last for about 20, 30 minutes to, 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 uh, to hold off uh, reducing that blood, blood loss. Again, to maintain the, the blood level in us. When this happens, we also form a, what we call a platelet plug. When the uh, blood vessel is damaged, there is a, a protein inside the blood vessel called collagen. And this collagen attracts platelets, okay? So then the platelets will stick to the collagen. Well, as platelets stick together, they release some chemicals that attract more of them. So they uh, we will get more platelets there to stick to it, which release more. So, so this is what we call a positive feedback, okay? And these do stick to the collagen. And this is that plug, it's kind of plugging up the holes, a little, kind of a log jam going on, is a way to think of it. These work in smaller blood vessels all, also, but the bigger ones than what you can than what you have to worry about with the um, vascular spasm. This will, this will help a bigger, a bigger blood vessel. Our uh, most severe case is what we call coagulation or the actual blood clot. And this is going to, again, reinforce the plug that has already occurred there with something called a fibrin mesh. Uh, to get, now to get to that fibrin mesh, first of all, we got, you know, there's lots of proteins that are made in the liver that circulate in the blood. They're in your blood right now waiting to be activated. Now we have two different pathways. There's called an intrinsic and an extrinsic pathways. We're not gonna worry really about the differences between the two of them. Just know that there are two separate starting points to get to this. Because uh, both of them are going to lead to this prothrombin activator, and that's where we're going to kind of pick up the story on us. Right. So, prothrombin activator is uh, released, then it converts prothrombin, which is a protein in the blood, um, is a uh, protein that's created in the liver and circulates in the blood. And what it does, it changes it from prothrombin to thrombin. All right. Now, thrombin is going to convert fibrinogen, which is also released in from, uh, hit there from your liver, to fibrin. Now, fibrin, as you read on the bottom one here, it's a sticky mesh, and it causes the plasma in your blood to thicken up, uh, become more viscous, and pretty much anything that sticks to it gets you get a touch it, it gets stuck to it. And I kind of think of a kind of a spider web in that aspect. And it just blocks everything off. And it'll do this until, and once these, a clot can last a long time and it gives the uh, blood vessel a chance to be repeal, uh, repaired. We have a picture of these, hold on. Well, here's the pathways on it. So again, there's your spasm, it breaks. And notice the arrows are all going in, it's squeezing in. Then you have your collagen is exposed in that broken vessel, so your uh, platelets start to stick to it. And then here you have the coagulation, which is that fibrin mesh. All right. Again, there's that intrinsic pathway, the extrinsic, until we get down to here. And here's your prothrombin activator, turning the prothrombin into thrombin, turning the fibrinogen into fibrin, and that gives you your fibrin mesh. All right. So that was the this is what a fibrin mesh looks like. All this uh, stringy stuff on the outside, that is the fibrin. Your red blood cells stick to it. Uh, there is some bacteria stuck to it there. Anything and everything that stick, uh, touches it will get stuck to it. And it really does just plug up a hole. And, uh, and it'll, it's more durable than the platelet plug. 
So and it'll last longer, again, more durable. So that way you can um, uh, stop the bleeding until you, your blood vessel can be repaired. Uh, this works on even large blood vessels uh, up to a certain point. Uh, if you break an artery, a major artery, you're going to lose a lot of blood faster than it can actually happen. Uh, that's why you put pressure on bleeds. Uh, if you're bleeding, you put pressure on them, slow it down, so that way the, the, the uh, mesh can occur. All right, so blood types. Uh, three main types, A, B, and O. Um, if you have an A uh, blood type, then you have an A agglutination protein, and then B is a B, B agglutination, and O means neither one of those two are in there. And O is the most common in uh, North America. We also have an RH uh, factor on here, and these are what we call the deagglutination. Uh, they're either positive or negative. Most people in the United in the North America here are positive. So, uh, the most common blood type in the in North America is O positive. Okay, and it's just about whether proteins are present or not present. Okay, so looking here, an AB person has both the A and the B. They are a universal recipient because they can take blood from a person with A or B or a person with no. Because if you don't have any proteins, uh, that's what it's saying right here, then the uh, foreign body is not going to, uh, or to be a um, body, your blood, your immune system is not going to recognize it as being anything there. So uh, A can take blood from A, B can take blood from B, O can take blood from O, which, yes. A can also take blood from O, and B can take blood from O. So if we come back over here, again, A and B can take blood from everybody. See, A, B, A, A, B, and O. B can take B from B and O, A from A. O can only take it from O, all right? And then you gotta, gotta figure in the uh, positives, the, uh, the RH positive, RH negative, all right? Um, so an O negative can only take blood from O negative. O positive can take blood from O positive and O negative and so forth like that. And they're giving you some percentages of them here. So uh, most Native Americans are O. Uh, Hispanics, most of them are O. Blacks, about 50-50. Whites, pretty close to that. Asians, still pretty close. So that's why most are, are O. And that's why we go back to our notes. O is the most common in North America. We have a pretty big melting pot in this country. So again, this is, uh, and it's all just based on proteins. Okay. So that is it for blood, short and sweet. See you later.